Well, thanks everybody for coming. I know it's very early on a Saturday. It's pretty tough for me. I'm from California. Uh, I want to thank Dan especially, Schechner from PRI, for arranging this. And then, of course, my panelists. All you guys for getting up so early. We have Morgan Lucas from Lucas Oil on the left, on my left, you're right. Trent Whatcott, Spillback. Kyle Keitzman from Bell. Bill Tishner. Holly, everybody knows Bill. Scott Cobbett from Will Pros and Julian Gill. Julian's with IBOC. Hey, so we know who the panelists are and who we are up here, but I'm curious on a Saturday morning, 8 a.m., who came to attend? We've done the seminar for a few years in a row, and it's typically racers. And I'd like to take a quick uh, survey of the audience. How many of you guys are racers or race teams? Okay, most of you. How many tracks or sanctioning bodies uh, promoters? Oh, quite a few also, good. Uh, any marketing directors or brands, companies, manufacturers? Okay, excellent. How many of you guys are in the media? Okay, a couple. How many are unemployed looking for a job? <laughs> yeah. Okay, a couple of those too, all right. I guess we got everything covered. That's cool. So the way this started is I've been doing this panel for a few years on how to teach racers, teams, and sanctioning bodies how to raise money from sponsorships. Um, at Lucas Oil, we see hundreds of sponsor me decks every year. Uh, I'm sure of all, all the other brands here have as well. And I have to say 99.9% .9 of them always offer exposure in exchange for cash or product. But the reality is that's not what we're looking for. That's not really what a brand always wants. It's a small component, but that's not the whole thing. If you think about it like this, you know, we're at Lucas Oil. We own the series. We own a television network. In fact, we own six racing series. We own a TV network. We own the Lucas Oil Speedway. We sponsor PBR, we sponsor AMA Motocross, we sponsor NHRA, we, we do a lot. We have our logo in a lot of places. We sponsor the Lucas Hall Stadium. So we don't really need exposure. What we're doing this for is to create goodwill. We're looking for sales, we're creating branding, networking. But most of the proposals that we get always offer exposure. And so a few years ago, I wrote a book that explains to our racers, I wrote them for our race teams, what companies want from sponsorship. And uh, it's actually helped quite a few teams. We've given away a lot of books, sold a lot of books. And I think it has changed the way a lot of teams and properties and sanctioning bodies and uh, promoters are now approaching brands. And it's adding more value because in motorsports, we're competing with a lot of other sports. We really need to add value to everybody. And so... The book is called Motorsports Marketing and Sponsorship. It explains what companies want from sponsorship. And if you think about it, everybody wants something different. Today we're at PRI, so we're a racing industry, we're automotive industry, very specific needs for this industry. But if you're approaching a retailer, let's say Home Depot, they want foot traffic into their stores. If you're trying to get a sponsorship from a beverage company, beverage companies like Rockstar Energy, Monster Red Bull, they typically want sampling. If you go to a service company, let's say a bank, insurance company, they, they typically want leads, they want new customers. Tool companies, they want hands-on sampling so you can try out their products. Old companies, they usually want legacy, perhaps to draw back customers that have been lured over by a competitor. Young companies, they're looking for exposure, they're looking for credibility, they're trying to open up distribution channels, they want new sales. Auto manufacturers typically want transfer of technology. They want to take what works in the aftermarket and perhaps move that over to the, the car manufacturer and make it part of a, a new vehicle. So exposure is a given. If you're going to write a deck and put a proposal together, you, you do need to have the visibility of the company and part of your program, but it's not really what a company's going to pay for. So today, I asked these panelists to come up and help discuss and explain to the, the group what the brands are looking for. Um, when Lucas Oil sponsors you, we want you to become an extension of our marketing. We want you to market for us in regions and areas that we don't reach and don't have employees and where we aren't yet marketing. We want you to open new doors for us. We want you to create new relationships, you know, whether it's business to business or business to consumer. But don't take my word for it. I'm just going to start this off. I'd like for you guys to listen to the pros here. These, these, the. My panelists here <clears throat> have, man, the, the knowledge and the experiences, I, I can't even explain it, but 
I wanted to get panelists from both sides, ones that have been doing this a long time and know the business and can explain. And then I also brought in a company that just started in motorsports. And so you can hear the perspective of a new, new company that has, I think, only been sponsoring motorsports for perhaps a year, a year and a half. And you can get a whole new perspective on it. So without much more for me, I'll start, start on my left, the right. And I'm just going to ask a few questions, and we're going to have this sort of as a discussion among the panelists. But Morgan Lucas has been on both sides of the equation. Um, we know that he's raced NHRA, and also we sponsor through Lucas Oil a lot of different race teams. So he's seen both sides of it. When you raced Morgan, when you raced NHRA, what did your sponsors want, and how does that sort of relate now to what Lucas looks for in sponsoring and rep race teams that represent the brand? They were looking for, well, let me do this right. Uh, they were looking for exposure, I mean, television time, impressions. Uh, when Geico was with us, uh, as a prime example, they had a formula for cost per impression. So as a flat rate, if uh, the sponsorship is worth a million dollars, that's a lot of money. I'm not, not acting like that's normal, okay. But if it were that, they'd want to see probably I would think at that point at least three million impressions or four million impressions to go with that because they equate everything to the rest of their marketing. So if you looked at a billboard, how much does it cost to, to run that billboard and how many eyeballs are looking at that billboard on a regular basis? New eyeballs, existing eyeballs, things like that. Um, and I, I don't know marketing probably as well as everybody else up here, um, but I feel like that is a good thing to get. But in today's day and age with social media, you're trying to create more of a a lifestyle approach. Social media has, I think, robbed a lot of the impact that television has had on motorsports at points. Um, people are uh, watching the internet more than they're watching television at times, and they're getting their updates, they're getting their feedback. So a lot of the relationships that are established with drivers, and this was happening towards the end of my career with the team, and I was never big on social media relationships. Um, I, I feel like you have to find additional added value situations in order to, uh, I think, deliver for your sponsors now. And, and, and when you say added value, that might be a thing of the past. I think it's probably now the new normal. You have to find ways to reach people outside of the racetrack, whether it is social media, whether it's uh, events, things like that. But um, I'm probably going off on a different tangent here. But. Yes. Meredith, there's, there's someone from PRI here. I just realized we only have one microphone among the seven of us. Is there, yeah. there is another mic? Okay, great. Hello. Hello. There, we go. there we go. Okay, now we can a little bit more mobile here. Appreciate that. Uh, added value, that's interesting because I've often said that a lot of the value that Lucas Oil receives from our teams is not what they do when they're racing, but it's what the teams do between the races, off season, during the middle of the week. How do you represent our brand? How do you represent the brand when you're not at the racetrack? Um, I know that Bill and Scott, you guys have some comments on that. We'll see if this microphone works here. What, what is your primary purpose, Bill, of sponsoring? What does Holly do to sponsor race teams? And is it networking, exposure, new sales channels? You know, you know for us, um, we've got, a, we got our, our tiger by the tail because we've got about 30 brands and 25,000 part numbers that we're trying to sell. <laughs> and every racer in the world wanting them for free. So um, we, we um, it's hard, you know, obviously we can't talk to everybody individually and all the racers need to be buying our parts so we can get a paycheck. That's, a, that's the way it works. Um, so we sift through a lot. Um, and, uh, you know, we're still involved with contingency programs through a lot of different uh, sanctioning bodies so we can reach a lot of racers and hopefully, um, you know, pay the winners. Um, you know, we don't, we don't do individual cash sponsorships per racer, never have in my 24 years at Holly. Um, uh, you know, what we look for is when we try to, when we come out with something new, I'll take Holly EFI, for example. Um, you know, we're more than a carburetor company nowadays. We're pretty, pretty big into fuel injection. 
Um, always have been since I was there, but within the last decade, we came out with a pretty nice product. So what we tried to do there is seed our product with some pretty, pretty high-profile guys and um, that were winners, um, but w that could also tech our pro help us tech our product at the track and help us, you know, support other racers as it, as they're all learning about this this particular product. Um, so that's pretty much our, you know our approach is you know don't give away old products. Um, try to seed some new products because um, that's our you know that's our lifeblood is selling new stuff. Um, and then uh, you know really over the the last, uh, actually, it's, honestly, it's been a decade, but we created a Holly LS Fest. We wanted to jump into the LS market and uh, kind of knew that if we put some ads in a hot rod magazine and say, hey, you know, we got some LS parts for you guys, um, they would have looked at us and said, what do you carburetor guys know about an LR, what we like? So we kind of showed them we liked what they liked and threw a party for them, and it worked like magic. Um, and it really forced us to get down in the grassroots and know people one-on-one, -on -one, and it's been, um, you know, it's been, it's been great. LS Fest has also been good for Lucas, as uh, not only do you sponsor racers, but you have brands that sponsor LS Fest. Lucas Oil is involved with LS Fest. Tom Bogner, who manages our motorsports program, uh, loves it. It's been a great, great venue for him. Yeah, it worked him. out pretty good to get other people to pay for our marketing. <laughs> right on, right. So, and and uh, to your right is is Scott Cobbett. Scott with Wheel Pros. What's your primary purpose of sponsoring race teams? So I'm I'm kind of in a quasi situation here where um, Wheel Pros owns about 14 different brands, um, wheel brands. So you know, on one end of the spectrum, we own American Racing, which is arguably the first aftermarket wheel brand ever, started in 1956. So from an American racing aspect, I'm not necessarily looking for exposure anymore. Does anybody in this room not know who American racing is? Okay, good, good answer. Um, I'm looking for something that creates a sales return, right? Marketing is typically viewed by other people as a revenue, non-revenue generating operation. And so a brand like American racing, I'm looking for more how are you going to help me sell wheels? How can I quantify a sales number against what you're doing um, that hits our bottom line? On the other end of the spectrum, you know, we launched a new wheel brand 18 months ago. So that one I'm looking for pure exposure. So we go to influencers, and I know we're going to talk more about this, but social media, love it or hate it, it's here, and that's the king. So you know, we're looking to penetrate people that are active in the market. Um, a good example is we launched a new power sports line. Uh, UTV wheels. So I'm looking for racers that are highly regarded in works, uh, King of Hammers experience, um, builds, and things like that. So it, it's really a twofold depending on what, which brand it comes down to, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's great. It's translating to sales, I think, is, is why we're all here. And, yeah. and in fact, that's a great transition to our newest partner in racing. It's a, I'll take that microphone here. And I'm going to give that to, to Trent Wetkop from Spillback because I'm just going to naturally assume that Spillback got involved with racing in order to develop sales channels. We did. So, you know, uh, we started about five years ago, and um, we've only been on the market completely since November three years ago when we launched at SEMA. And um, how many of y'all in your in your uh your career in racing or in, in track management or whatever, deal with spills? Oil spills. Who will admit to it? How many of y'all like to buy fluid absorbents and pay the money that could go to something else to an absorbent? Right. So we realize that, and that's, that's fine. We deal with that. I mean, there are things I buy in my life that I don't want to have to buy, but it's a reality that I deal with. And so we started looking at what... What are these big markets that we go after? Environmental cleanup, remediation, and ports, and um, you know, automotive, obviously, but machinery and janitorial services. What are the things that they enjoy doing in their lives? And one of the things that came back consistently with every market that we looked into was motorsports. And um, what we're looking for out of sponsorship is we're looking for awareness. Um, we're looking for a way to be able to connect with people when 
they're not at the point that they've got to go buy an absorbent. We're looking for them at a point where they're having a good time and doing the thing that they love in their life. Um, because one of the realities of it is what, what came back to us is we are also motorsports fanatics. And uh, this doesn't feel like work. I mean, uh, you know, I'm there, you know, on a Saturday and Sunday at the Lucas Oil Modified Series or, or uh, at an NHRA event. And I have to pinch myself because, you know, five years ago, this is not what I was doing. But they, they call this thing work. And um, what we're looking for is connection. We're looking for people to talk to. And um, it never fails. You know, we have a Swede in Pomona at the... Um, at the NHRA track, and Thursday and Friday is always dead. We don't even invite customers there, um, but what we do is we go out into the stands and we give people our tickets, and it never fails. Of the people that come in, that's somebody who has a need for spills in their life. So we're looking for people who can connect. We're looking for good people to, to wear our, our colors as they're so going So I have down a question the then on, on that note is, how do you value the sponsorship? So, so with... Brands is there, there are typically two types of value that we get from representation of racers. It's an intangible and tangible. Tangible is easy. Those are the media impressions. That's the number of times you get um, us in media, magazines. It's the sales channels that you help us open. It's the, the things that are physical that can actually be valued. But then there's also intangible value, which is the reputation of a team, the integrity of the team, the fan affinity, the perhaps the strength of the series. Do you differentiate between the tangible and the intangible values now, or do you value one more than the other? Because I've always heard that, that tangible value, you can put a number on it using a media rate card, but the intangible, that could be priceless. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to sales. And, you know, if, if it's not bringing in revenue for us, we have a responsibility to our principal to, to no longer do it. Um, so obviously the tangible is very important. The intangible for us is... Um, we feel like that is what will lead us to the tangible. If we focus on the intangible, the, the tangible will come. There you go. And then Kyle, how about yourself with, with Bell Racing? How do you value sponsorships? Well, certainly um, uh, from our perspective, we're looking at uh, you know, brand ambassadors, people that are going to have an influence on hopefully other, other racers buying our products. So we also look by racing segment as well. So you, you may say, okay, we, we we have a world champion, Lewis Hamilton, and, and that has impact on the brand. But then we also look at a marketing segment like uh, sprint car dirt racing. So we may have an athlete like uh, a Carson Macedo, who is our athlete of the year, who is a young up and coming person that is influencing sales and we view him as a great brand ambassador. Why is that? You know, a few years ago, um, many of you might remember Jason Myers, who was a two time World of Outlaw champion. He brought Carson to our booth and said, I'm working with this young man. Um, I think a lot of him. I think highly of him. And I think he would be a great representative of your brand. And so we decided to sponsor him based on Jason's recommendation because ultimately we want to work with good people who are going to influence other racers to buy our products because that's really what it's all about. And, you know, we've seen Carson progress and... Uh, be one of those young guys that's really active on social media, that's promoting our brand, that's influencing other younger up-and-coming drivers to wear Bell. And, and, and that's what we're looking for because ultimately we need those influencers to help sell products to, uh, to grassroots racers. And then, and then what, do you, what does Bell give your race teams? Is it, is it compensation? Is it money? Is it media? Is it publicity? Is it product? Combination? Typically, most of our sponsorships are product related. Um, you know, it's, there are so many uh, worthy racers, worthy race teams that it would be impossible for us monetarily to, to support everybody. So we really look at product sponsorship opportunities. Um, at, a, at a track level, we, we became the official helmet of Knox, uh, Knoxville Raceway because we, we, we um, did a product sponsorship to protect their uh, flag, flagmen and, and some of their push truck people. So those are the types of sponsorships that we look for. And then out of that, there's added value and partnerships that we can do with marketing and exposure and uh, hopefully things that are going influence, to uh, influence other tracks to adopt better safety standards. And uh, ultimately, that helps everyone. Mm, right on. Thank you. On the other end of the table, Julian. 
what does IBOX Springs look for, or how do you value sponsorships, some of your racers and teams? Well, I suppose it's always going to come down to selling more product. I mean, that's, that's the most one. Um, it, tangible and intangible, I don't, really, I don't really see a difference. It's, all, it's all, always going to be the same. Um, but the, teams money? Product. No, we never give money. Um, it's always product. And it's, it's, we see it as a two-way street. Um, you know, our, our best teams will always give us uh, the uh, impressions and, and, and stuff like that. But we're they always we're trying to make sure that they are uh, uh, maximizing our network as well. They mustn't forget what we can do for them. You know, we can, if, they, if they're helping us sell product out, out there and, and promoting, we can do the same. They can use our, our networking, um, our social media, and we can help push them. How do you look for a team? How, what do you look for in a proposal or a deck when someone sends you something? And before we get into the answers, I, the, the book that I wrote actually has two full chapters on decks and proposals because there is a difference. And a lot of you out there will send one document thinking it's the same thing. There is a difference between a deck and a proposal. A deck is what you use to draw the attention of a potential sponsor. It's colorful, it could be a video, perhaps it could be a link to a website. It shows off what you've done and it, it gets the interest. And then once a conversation is started, then the proposal becomes more specific to that brand. What can you do for an oil company or a suspension company or a carburation company? What can you do for the specific company, let's say it's a beverage company, and how are you going to activate for them? And the proposal will go into more specifics. It could be a Word document, you know, that won't be a video per se. And it might list the events that you're going to. Perhaps it lists the, the cost of the sponsorship, which by the way, the price that you put on sponsorship should never be based on what it costs you to race. The price of the sponsorship should be based on the value to the sponsor. What type of media value or product value are you giving the sponsor in exchange for that new relationship? And so, when looking for something in a deck or a proposal, does anybody on the panel here have any specifics? What, what do you look for that draws your attention that perhaps will help you in sponsoring a race team? I, it's the old saying, is it first impression counts. It's got to be professionally presented. It's got to be colorful. Um, you know, and I, I asked our marketing manager, what are you looking for when it comes across your deck? Across your desk, sorry, not deck. And he said, it's the layout, it's the graphics, it's, it, it gives him a story. He wants to know what we, you're going to do for us first, because we don't want just someone to say, give me springs. You know, why should we? What are you going to do for us? And that we're looking for a schedule of participation throughout the year, not just, oh, we're racing in this series, we're going to need four different rates. It's how are you going to help us get more exposure? How are you going to increase the networking from what we do? Um, and how are you going to reach and engage with your community and then help us extend that further? I think that's our main point. And, and real quick, while we're on that topic, is when, when do you make your sponsorship decision? Because a, a lot of teams will send out November, December, thinking that, oh, race season is over, therefore it's starting again, but, you know, we have different fiscal years, and this is what I like to educate some of the younger racers is, Japanese company, their fiscal year end Mar ends March 31st, so if you're approaching Honda, Toyota, Kawasaki, they start their year on April 1. If you're looking for a government supplier, someone that deals with the government, let's say, or the government itself, like the U.S. Army, um, even Apple Computer, their fiscal year ends September 30th. If you're sending them a deck in October, it's already too late. They're going to make their decision July and August. Lucas Oil, our fiscal year ends December 31st. So right now is a good time to be approaching Tom Bogner at Lucas Oil. We are making our decisions right now. Julian, how about Ibox Springs? Well, we, find, uh, we set the finances as in a fiscal year for generally the first. So by now we've already decided what amount of money we're going to spend globally in 2019. But we don't release that all in one go. We let it run. I mean, there are certain things, certain series you're going to get set up with certain race teams that we have long established relationships. And we're probably talking back to them in August about 2019 already. So, we get, so they're set. But we will always hold a, a reserve for circumstances that we're not expecting. I mean, right. as a CEO, I'm delighted when my marketing department tells me that we didn't spend it all. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> However, 
for the other side. Uh, you know, they, they need to, they, we need to use it. But there are, there are some people who are doing one-off series or one-off races, sorry, and they perhaps won't know until September. So it's always good if we've got a bit of budget left for the rest of the year. Excellent. Let's just go down the list. Scott, how about yourself with Will Pros? Um, we run January, December 31st, our calendar ends. We typically, um, uh, just to back up, we have a mix of paid and product, um, but we typically made our decisions by October. Um, same thing, we have a little slush fund we keep aside for extraordinary, extra, extraordinary circumstances, but I mean, if we don't see something that really we think is gonna turn around by October, that's pretty much when our decision is made. Um, we have budgets submitted. I submitted mine the week of SEMA. So um, that's another thing. I don't know, everyone goes to SEMA thinking they're gonna nail down something. We've already made our decisions by SEMA. So uh, again, and to go back to the proposal thing, I think you know he nailed it on the head. It's really about what are you bringing to the table for us? Um, cool, you won two races. Awesome, congratulations. I'm happy for you, but um, you're almost a, an extension of us at this point. So how are you bringing value to us? And if you can articulate that right off the bat, let's talk. All right, Bill, how about Holly? Um, a more fiscal year, like January through December. Um, but, uh, you know, um, doesn't mean that if something really great comes along, I can't figure something out, but it better be really great <laughs> um, because we are, you know, uh, even, even though we're a big company, you, you've got a budget you got to live within or you're in trouble. And uh, Don O'Neill shaking his head back there because I'm holding him off on a couple parts till January because I'm over budget <laughs> for the year. So... Um, uh, but he's a good example of, you know, he's taking, he's taking the LS engine and going into a spot in NHRA that's kind of uncharted territory, so I think he's going to make some noise and he wins a lot of races, so I'm gonna, he's going to go represent our parts, you know, there uh, for us. And kind of for us, it's, it tends to be a lot of long-term relationships, so, you know, don't think you're going to walk up and 10 minutes later walk away with a, a sponsorship. You might, you know, you might need to see me a couple times, meet me at PRI, you know, I'll see your grit, you know, these kids down here, you know, uh, you know, show me, tell me what you're about and stay in touch with me for a few years and we'll see what, you know, might happen. But, you know, um, as far as a proposal, uh, make it short and sweet because I don't have a lot of time. Don't write a big paragraph. Don't, I can't stand if I open something and this is just me personally. But if it's, it's just paragraphs and pages, I can't weed through that. I can't wrap my head around that. You know, my, my phone's going off. My, somebody's texting me, and uh, emails are popping in. So just make it bullet points quick, like what, what I can do for you, uh, high level, and, you know, your, your, um, you know, your accomplishments pretty quick so I can see if it's somebody that's an influencer. Um, you know, we really have... The best success for you and for us is going to be, do you really want our product? Don't ever build a car based on what you can get free, because you're probably going to lose racing. <laughs> um, you're going to have a cobbled up race car is what you're going to get. Um, so the best people for us is when a guy loves our parts because he really loves our parts, and then he promotes them for us. Um, so a good example, um, I don't know if any of you, these young guys might know Cletus McFarland. He's all over YouTube right now. Um, I met him uh, actually at LS Fest, part of the other magic of LS Fest. He had his uh, Leroy car um, a couple years ago, and he was, he, was, he was getting to the edge of his stock computer, and he couldn't get any faster. So uh, one of my other Instagram guys that we work with, one of the best in the business, he kind of slipped me a note. He's like, dude, Cletus is getting ready to switch, and I think he's going to pick a Hall Tech. Um, and so we went over and um, just introduced ourselves and said, hey, here's what our product can do for you, for real. And we think we can make you faster. And um, showed him we, had, we were going to have his back with tech support, and uh, we made him faster. And now he promotes our product because he really loves our product, and that's what you really want is not just some guy that took it because it was free and – forgets about you, um, that your best ambassadors really love it and then, you know, go out and sell it for you. Um, so, uh, 
you know, always, always pick the right part for, for your racing and, um, you know, uh, do, do, do everything because you love it, right? So uh, whether you're a track, whether you're a track promoter, um, sanctioning body, um, you know, always realize that that guy, that, that guy there racing is, um, he doesn't have to be there. You know, he's, uh, he's got a lot of things he can do with his spare time. Um, and uh, be glad that he's there spending his money with you um, as, a, as a racetrack or a sanctioning body. And treat them like you want them there, you know. Um, uh, you know, when we do, when we do our, our LS Fest, Kerry Strange helps me with that from FM3. I, I get our entire mark, our entire, we take about 80 people from Holly and actually put on this event. That's, that's like crazy. And I put them all in a room in, a, in the cafeteria and I, and I tell them, you know, hey, these people can go to the lake this weekend. They can go race somewhere else this weekend, but they want to come hang out with us. So thank, you know, be grateful. And these are, these are the people that buy our parts. So let's tell them thanks when they come in and tell them thanks when they leave. And uh, let's have a great big party. And, um, you know, that, that's, been the, that's been the magic for us behind, behind that is, uh, uh, you know, we're truly doing it because we truly want to do it. That's a valid point because there are so many options nowadays with uh, entertainment and what people could be doing on their spare time. Yep. So I'll take that. Kyle, how about with bell racing? Yeah, so our, our budgets are, um, you know, we have a, a calendar a fiscal year, so uh, it ends December 31st, but really our athlete rosters, uh, we, we finish up our budgeting in October. And so mostly our athlete rosters for the next year are really set by then. And, and a lot of that is based on, in our world, um, we work with athletes that have other sponsorships. So typically they start uh, custom painting helmets fairly early in the season. So we have to have our athlete lock, roster locked in. There's always, there's always a, a budget for things that come up or athletes that you might want to work with. But... Uh, Really, uh, frankly, our roster of athletes is set by the time we get to PRI for the next year. So we really don't have a lot of room left in the budget, but we will make exceptions for, for, for certain uh, potential uh, brand ambassadors. Uh, one, one comment I want to make in terms of athletes that we work with helping to sell product. A good example is Matt Crafton. Matt Crafton is a multi-time NASCAR truck champion, but Matt also races a dirt late model. And what's great about Matt is he's out there promoting the brand. He's bringing customers to us. He's selling helmets. He's, uh, he, you know, he's texting us and saying, I've got a guy that's interested in this. Can you, can you help me? So he's, he's really, really trying to not only promote the brand and influence other people, but he's bringing us sales. And that's really what we're looking for when we, when we sponsor someone as an athlete. Thank you. Trent? I wish we were as organized as Bill. Um, you know, we, uh, as, as far as pitch decks and, um, and proposals go, you know, I'll have a lot of people contact me and, and I'll schedule a time to talk with them and they'll send me an email that says, you know, in advance of our conversation, here's my proposal. And um, I don't even open them because really I want to talk to the person first and I want to get to know them. Um, you know, I, my background is in sales and marketing, and um, one, of the, one of the things that you're taught very early on in sales is you never, never divulge, you, you keep the dollars out of the conversation in the beginning. And um, that's, the, the, the people that I, that I love to, to work with are people who do this because they're passionate about what they're doing. You know, a, a perfect example of this is a, a guy by the name of Anthony Vanetti. Um, he, uh, I, I, I love this guy. He is as down to earth as it gets. And, um, you know, I, it, it was me and a couple of other people on my team that developed the brand for Spillvac, and I'm very proud of it. But I, I can say Anthony is every bit as proud of Spillvac as, as I am. And uh, that's the kind of person I want to talk to. I don't want to talk to somebody who is first going to tell me they need $25,000 by next week. Um, and that's another thing to keep in mind, too, is, you know, we, we have a budget, but that's planned. And um, look at this as playing the long game. Give the, the sponsor time 
to, you know, if their budget, if I don't have the budget for it right then, I, uh, I report to a board of directors over a, a venture investment company, and every single member of that board is a bean counter. And um, they are taught to drive looking in the rearview mirror. And uh, I, I need time to be able to go and, and sell the value of having this athlete on board. Um, you know, and, and getting back to Anthony, the thing I love about him is he is out selling the product when he's talking to people. He's so excited about it. He uses our name when he's interviewed. Um, you know, he really, really wants to see this partnership succeed, and so he's willing to do whatever it takes to make that happen. Um, I had another thought, but I forgot what it was. No, well, thank you. I've already answered half of Lucas, our, our fiscal year, but Morgan, when you were racing NHRA, you had Japanese sponsors, you had American sponsors, you had a variety. What, what was their fiscal year, and when did they make decisions? Was there a mix in the timing of having to get all the sponsors together when they're all in different fiscal years, or was that never an issue? Uh, <clears throat> it was actually not as much of an issue for us because we kind of, uh, I think this has been mentioned, uh, you, you play the long game. Uh, you don't expect things to happen right away. Um, you you cultivate relationships. And I think that kind of goes back to some of the, the comments that have been said already. But uh, I think decks are amazing. I think they're a great way to portray information, uh, the scheduling, uh, even added value, kind of putting it on paper. But from my perspective, I think you want to invest in the person. You want to invest in the, the opportunity. Uh, for us at Lucas, we do a lot of product sponsorships. Um, and that's great. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but if you're a person and you come to a company and you're asking for money for sponsorship, but you've never even been interested in trying their oils, their products, any of their, their additives, or whatever it is, then it, it kind of makes it look like you're in it for the wrong reasons. Sometimes we like to have people that are, are going to be brand ambassadors. We want people that, that want to be part of the team because they're buying into the team. And not necessarily we're expecting you to go out and buy a bunch of products, but we want people that are out pushing these products. Jeff, he's a prime example. This gentleman started with us as a sponsorship guy. Dwayne, Dwayne works with us, Lucas Oil, Don O'Neill. These guys have been uh, involved in some capacity with our pro program for a long time, but they've never been afraid to go out and and pump that up. But to answer your question, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of had to touch on that last question a little bit, but uh, a lot of that impacted us, but we just had to stay regular with it. And I think a, a big deal with sponsors and fiscal years, all of that stuff, I think one thing you have to always remember is updating your representative with that company on a regular basis. Constantly letting them know your progress, what you've been doing, who you've been reaching, if you've been uh, at the track winning a race or going to a high school and talking to kids about the, your car and the programs and telling them, handing out stickers, flyers, whatever it is, everything matters. And in my opinion right now, grassroots level marketing, grassroots level effectiveness, that is probably one of the most important things motorsports can be offering in the world because we have to show the next generation of consumers and motorsports participants, uh, all of those people, what it's about. We have to get them excited about what we're doing. And I, I think showing your sponsors what you're doing is a big deal because it's refreshing in their mind all the effort that you're putting out there and all the things that you're doing for, for their company, for their brand. I agree with you, especially so. That's a very good point. Um, on that note, is I was speaking a few days ago with, um, I don't know if uh, he's here today. Let me look real quick. Stephen Beatty, Stephen here? No. Stephen is the president of Bill Shocks, and he was mentioning a pro light driver, his Ryan Beat. And he said, you know what I really liked about the sponsorship of Ryan Beat is that it's, it's a Bill Stein wrapped pro light truck, but Ryan is also co sponsored by General Tire. And General Tire used Ryan in a large television commercial campaign, hundreds of TV commercials, 30 second spots across different networks that because it was the Bill Stein wrapped truck, obviously Bill Stein piggybacked the visibility that General Tire purchased. And so Ryan is not just representing General in the commercials, he's representing all of his sponsors. And I think that it's a pretty good example of a successful sponsorship where it carries on from one brand to the next. When the brands start to promote each other and give each other credibility by being on the same level, 
I think this battery is running out, so maybe I'll grab I'll grab this battery from Kyle. You mentioned Ryan Beat. Um, uh, really good story for us. Met him at SEMA a couple times. Super, super nice kid. Um, he's you know pretty accomplished already. Actually, came from motocross, and now he's uh, racing off-road trucks. Um, but he wasn't pushy. He was, you know, met him a couple times. Got to like him. Got to know him. Stayed in touch with me. LS Fest West pops up. And he's from California. He's like, dude, what can I come do for you? I haven't even sponsored him yet. And uh, he's like, I'll, I'll be there. I'm going to bring my truck, and I'm going to do some donuts for you in this burnout contest with my spare truck. Nice. And, uh, you know, that's how you build a relationship by, you know, what can I do for you first? Nice. Um, so, um, and now we're, we're like buddies. You know, I text him and <laughs> check in on his racing, and I want him to win, and he's winning. Um, and he, he, found a, he found a product with us, our Excel um, ceramic plug wires. Um, he was, you know, those little tight engine compartments in his truck. He's burning plug wires. Well, he, he lost a race because he burned a plug wire. He was going to win the race. So I showed him a product that could solve a product problem, um, <laughs> gave him some plug wires, and now I'm using him in ads for the plug wires because we truly solved his problem. But, um, you know, he kind, of, he kind of extended the olive branch first and, is, you know, hey, Holly, don't, what can I do for you first meant a, meant a lot to us. And that's going to go a long way for a long time as far as I'm concerned. Fantastic. That's, we're running out of time here. We only have about 10 minutes left. We'll go real quick to Scott and then Julian. Um, do you guys have examples of successful sponsorships? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, he's touched on a little bit. I, I almost like to use the word partnership. Uh, we use our athletes a lot for R&D. Um, so when we're looking at people that potentially become part of the roster, these are also people that are gonna help us build a better product. Um, a good example is Ferrari. So we are one of two technical partners in the world with Ferrari, our Motegi brand, and Shell is the other one. But Motegi came to us because, again, they wanted our product. They went through testing, um, and it wasn't because, hey, you know, write us a check, put a sticker on a car, you have the best product that fits our vehicles the best. So outside of F1, every Ferrari race car is homologated with our wheel. So that's a great example. Um, on the off-road side, same thing. We actually work with Ryan Bede as well, and he's come in and helped us make a better ProLite wheel. Um, we've put sensors on his car. We're uh, measuring G-loads and corners and stuff like that to where they work as close with R&D as they do with marketing. And that creates a partnership where we're bringing major value to each other. He can speak well-educated about the product, and it's something that makes us both better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, here in the US, uh, our sales team, marketing team, love Bryce Menzies. They say he he's, keeps the name on the car, he keeps us in our com conversation, and he gives us lots of media content. And that's sort of, I know Alex touches on social media. And that's something people sometimes forget. I mean, a spring is not a very sexy thing to sell. And we need stuff from the people we sponsor. So the more that they can give us that we can put out there and make us look a bit sexier, we're very pleased. Globally, probably our most successful sponsorship was with Audi. Again, we only ever gave them product. It was a thing we ran with their DTM cars for about three or four years. And eventually, some of those engineers that were on the race team ended up in the OE production, and they took us with us. And that was great. So really, for three or four years, outlay a free product we've ended up with about 20 years worth of OE production, which is probably our most successful financially sponsorship. Wow, well with all these heritage brands, you guys have been doing this a long time, have you noticed that sponsorship has changed over the years? And then we'll just take the microphone, we'll back down the row and I'll wrap well, it up with that. Well, it's social media. I mean, it's, it's instant now. It's not, it it, it's not months of planning and printing and making a campaign, it's, it can change overnight with a trend. Good or bad, yeah. I take it. Yeah. They will say every happy customer tells three people. Nowadays, every upset customer can tell millions. <laughs> United Breaks Guitars. Scott, how's sponsorship changed over the years? Um, I'll go back to what I, I said previously. Partnership, not sponsorship, is one major thing. Social media, for sure. Um, I, can't, I can tell you right now, every single contract in my file cabinet has a social media clause in it. And it's also how social media is treated, right? So um, I actually have a PR background. Number one thing about PR is third-party endorsements, someone else talking about you. 
And the way we dictate our social media clauses and our contracts is we don't want you to be a commercial. We don't want you to just repost a picture of a wheel. Hey, they're great. They sponsor me. We want it to be organic. We want to see it on your wife's car. We want to see it on your buddy's car. Oh, hey, check this out. I threw this on my wife's Tahoe, Range Rover, whatever. Um, and you're talking about it like this is sweet. This is something cool that's happening. I like this brand. Um, it, it doesn't feel forced, and it doesn't feel like they're writing me a check. i got to post something. Shit, I'll just grab a picture off the internet and post it real quick, right? <laughs> Usually doesn't work well. Uh, how's it changed? So like the days of I'll put your decal on my car are done. Um, and, and truly, really, that was never a great great anyway you you better you better do more than that and be a brand ambassador you know like i said because you, you truly are into the parts thank you bill kyle yeah certainly same for here the, the the environment's really changed and we mentioned content creation and social media so the the downside of that for for young guys that are in the sport too is to think about what you're actually putting out on social media because as brands the first thing we do when we, when we look at an athlete that we're trying to build a relationship is, is we look at what you're posting on social media. We look at how you conduct yourself. We look at how you work with other sponsors. And so that's just something to be aware of as you're, as you're posting things and, and creating content. Um, one thing to mention, too, is Ryan Beat's actually a Bell athlete. So you might want to benchmark Ryan as someone you should look at. Right on. Yeah, things have changed a lot since we started this back in 2018. Um, I, re I remember those early days. It was crazy. Um, you know, one thing I will say is, um, you know, there's to to me there's always room to do something, and um, you know, if, if if it's not this big sponsorship, um, we developed a program we call Spillback Sponsor Speed and it allows us to help people out when we can um, if they're willing to put forth a little bit of work beforehand. But that makes it where we don't have to turn people away because, that, you know, I, I talked to a lot of these grassroots racers, and this is their dream. And uh, I think of dreams I've had before that if I just had somebody help me out or when somebody has helped me out, I've been able to do something. Um, keep, keep that in mind, too, as you go to a sponsor. Maybe there is some way... To, to work into a relationship with them. Great. I think there's been a lot of great points up here, a lot of facts. Um, and so I just want to add to that. And in my opinion, um, especially because I went from the racing side where I was good at spending money, now I'm on the sales side of Lucas Oil where I have to be good at making money. So <laughs> totally different transition in life. Yeah. But uh, I feel like motorsports marketing, it, with this, we all meet so many people. We have so many opportunities in life to, uh, I think, make connections. And business to business is a great way to put your sponsored company, your brand that you are, are hooked up with, out there in front. And what, Spillback is a prime example. You might know people that have shops, auto shops, installers that, that need their products. Uh, you might know somebody who's got a motorcycle shop that needs Bell helmets. It can go on down the road. But the point is, is that there are always opportunities for you to go out there and put your brands in front of other people. And then you can go back, talk to your market officer and tell them that you're out there repping them. You all kind of by proxy become a sales rep for a company. But at the end of the day, it shows the, the effort that you're putting forth um, in a situation. You've got to reach those eyeballs. You've got to reach those people. And at the end of the day, as companies that are marketing, our, our goal is to sell. So if you can go out there and help us sell and bridge some gaps, that's just going to add longevity and an impact from, and that might not be what you want to hear, but I think there's a lot of truth to that for us at least. Uh, we like to know that people are on our side working on our behalf. That's what it's all about. Help us sell more product. That's, that's why we're doing this. Well, we have run out of time. Um, I put my business cards and some books in the back. My daughter Lexi's back there selling any if you guys would like a copy. Uh, we are going to wait here for a few minutes as the panelists. You guys can come and ask us some, some questions one-on-one. -on -one. We have about five to seven minutes before we have to leave and uh, head down to the show. So I'd like to thank all my panelists for getting up early and coming. That was great. Thank you, guys, and everybody for attending.